So welcome. Um, before I jump in, my name is Lucas Wright. I'm a senior educational developer at the Center for Teaching Learning Technology. And when I think Gen AI caught our, a lot of our interest in 2022, although it's been around a lot longer, I had a little bit of space in my portfolio and time to kind of play with it, uh, tinker with it, and then do a lot of workshops around it. And through that and some research I've been doing, I, I've i learned quite a bit, but I wouldn't want to po put myself as an expert in this space. I'm someone here to facilitate your learning and to share some of the knowledge I've gained. So welcome. And I'm going to share slides now. So today's session is focused on using generative AI for designing teaching materials or teaching and learning materials. And I think as sessions go, this is one of my favorites because there's less considerations around things like student privacy, scaffolding, student uh, work within it. And it's something, it's a low hanging fruit in terms of what we can use generative AI for. So just to start us off, I would like to acknowledge that um, we're coming today from UBC Vancouver, which is on traditional Musqueam territory. Also, I'm coming to you from my home, which is in Port Moody, which is on Coquitlam, Tooth, and Stolo territory. And I also want to acknowledge when we think about generative AI, there's some, it's fraught with challenges around knowledge, but in particular around indigenous knowledge. So this is a quote from um, an interview that David Gardner did this year. And David Gardner is a professor at UBC. And he points out to some of the challenges around generative AI and indigenous knowledge. So AI's capacity for content generation, powered by vast textual corpora, often lacks the context and nuance necessary to represent Indigenous stories, history, and politics. This can lead to misrepresentation and appropriation, contributing to the harmful ideology of settler colonialism. So just to kind of locate generative AI um, in terms of what it might mean for Indigenous knowledge and some of the harms that it could be doing. So the plan for today. We're going to talk about considerations when creating teaching materials. And I, I realize I left it off the agenda. We're also going to talk about some issues around creating teaching materials with generative AI. Then we're going to delve into some specific teaching materials. And we're going to take a look at creating case study scenarios, developing quizzes and problem sets, developing learning materials, and then a couple emerging trends um, that we're seeing in terms of material development. And the way that we're doing this session is I've created a worksheet and I'm hoping that you can follow along with me uh, using the worksheet. I just linked it into the Google Docs and I'm gonna share this with you in a moment. And what you'll find on, all the, on the worksheet is all of the prompts that I talk about, as well as all of the activities that we're doing. So what I like to do is we'll go through a session. Um, I'll introduce an aspect of creating teaching materials with generative AI. And then you'll have a chance to try out the different prompts that we're using and some of the different tools we're using. I also encourage you, you may want to open up the worksheet and follow along as we go and try some of these prompts, you know, open another tab in your computer. In terms of tools that you may want to use, um, a couple tools you may be interested in. So ChatGPT for Omega is available now just with a login. Um, you don't need to pay for it. Also, if you're not interested in logging in, ChatGPT 3.5 is available. If you just Google ChatGPT 3.5, you can go there. A reminder at UBC, ChatGPT 3.5 has completed a privacy impact assessment. So this can be used responsibly in your classroom as it doesn't require a student login. You may also want to use Bing Chat or MS Copilot, which also has a PIA at UBC. And you can access, again, just Google Bing Copilot um, and you'll get to that um, 
tool that you can use. Or you may want to try other tools. I do quite a bit of my work with using Google Gemini, um, a Google product, especially when I want to access the internet um, with my prompts. And finally, Claude. And the new Claude, I think it's Sonnet 3.5, in benchmarking is turning out to be more powerful than generative AI, the, sorry, than chat GPT in a lot of contexts. I find personally, I use the paid version of Claude and I've changed my workflow to work with Claude. The writing's a little bit more natural for me and I prefer the interface. So please follow along with any of those different technologies. And again, I'm just gonna share the worksheet again if you haven't had a chance to go in there. So, Let's talk first about some opportunities for developing teaching materials with generative AI. And I think we're finding a space now where there's lots of ability to create on-demand teaching and learning materials. And by on-demand, I'm thinking about, you know, I've worked with faculty members who will need to quickly create a makeup exam for their, meta, their course in medicine. And they're able to use generative AI work with it and create an exam quite quickly. Um, on demand could also mean the ability to personalize resources for specific students. So we're seeing lesson plans, course plans created with generative AIs, examples, so sharing concepts from your discipline and having generative AI create examples and analogies that can be shared with students. We're gonna work around that in a moment. Questions for exams and problem sets, if you're in the STEM disciplines, case studies and scenarios, and then learning materials from PowerPoint slides to videos to interactive transcripts. And what we're going to do for the remainder of the session is we're going to be working through these different types of examples and giving you a chance to practice doing these examples. In the background of this is we will be talking a little bit about prompting and sharing some approaches that you may wanna use when you prompt generative AI to get a better output. So another aspect or another opportunity with generative AI is these personalized learning materials. This could include desi designing targeted skill practice for specific students or groups of students. And again, I think this differentiation is something that we've always done in our teaching, we've always known as good teaching, but in some cases, generative AI can allow us to more easily do this and do it more quickly to share with our students. Using generative AI to analyze and simplify assignment instructions for clarity, and even redefine some of our concepts for to simplify them for clarity. I know one challenge that faculty members often have is kind of unpacking context and simplifying them uh, so that the students they're teaching are able to understand their expertise knowledge. So, I want to start with one example. And Ethan Mollick, who is a professor at Wharton, talks a lot about using generative AI as, as a way to generate multiple examples we can share with our students from a specific concept. And I did this example from first year biology using generative AI. So I gave the concept of sensitivity or response to stimuli in the context of first year biology. And these are the examples that it provided me. And when we're thinking about generative AI, I think one of the challenges here is I'm not trained in biology. I don't have an expert sets of eyes in that. So even when I show you this, I'm not totally sure of the quality of these examples. And that's why we always need a human in the loop. We always need someone with the expertise to assess the examples, sort the examples, and evaluate the examples that we're sharing. So I'm going to start with a prompt now. And I'm going to demo this prompt with you. And then in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to play around with this prompt. What this prompt does is rather than just giving generative AI a prompt, what I'm asking it to do is interact with me a little bit and ask me questions. So I say you're an experienced teacher, so I've given the prompt a role, and you can create clear, accurate examples of concepts for students. I want you to ask me two questions. What concept do I want to explain? Wait for me to answer, 
and then ask the second question, who is the audience for the explanation? Then look up the concept and examples of the concept, provide a clear multiple paragraph explanation of the concept using four specific examples, and give me five analogies I can use to explain the concept in different ways. So let me demo this now. And again, I'm just gonna go to my worksheet and a reminder that all of the different prompts that I talk about are available on this workshop, on this worksheet. So I'm gonna grab this prompt and I'm gonna go into chat GPT now and I'll paste in the prompt. And again, this is going to interact with me a little bit to try to determine those concepts. So it's gonna ask me what concept I want to explain. And I'm gonna say transformative learning. And I'm choosing that because I do have an education background. So I'm able to understand the quality of the concept a little bit more. Great, now who the audience is for, I'm going to say uh, masters of education students. Wonderful. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me a detailed explanation of transformative learning, and then it's going to give me four specific examples of transformative learning. And in a moment, it should give me five analogies to explain transformative learning. So then what I can do is I can start sorting through this, judging the quality of the output, and thinking about how I might be able to use this as a learning resource, something that I can use within my class. So over to you. Again, I think the purpose of this workshop is to give you a chance to play with these different approaches and different tools. So what I'm gonna do is get you to spend, oh, sorry about that. I'll get you to spend a couple minutes now. And I would like you to select a concept from your discipline and I've given you the prompt, it's on the worksheet. Try the same prompt and see how well it explains the concept. So I'll give you about four minutes to do that. And then what I'd like you to do is to share in the chat and together on microphones, just what the quality of the output was. So Charlene's asking where to access the worksheet and I'll share that again with you, Charlene. And I think Rosie was impressed at the quality of the output there, noting that in the con in the comments. So let me reshare the worksheet. And again, I'll get you to paste in that prompt that I gave you right here. Um, you're an experienced teacher. I'll put it in the chat as well, just to make it a little bit easier for you and try it out for your discipline or area of expertise or domain. And I'll give you about four minutes to do that. And, and as we're doing that, I had a request in the chat to show us the same example using Claude. So I'm going to do that now um, as you're finishing up with your um, concepts and examples. And a reminder that right now, uh, Claude 3.5 Sonnet is paid version. And I think it does bring up these equity issues in terms of paid to play. Um, what I'm finding is I pay about $29 a month, I think with Claude, but I'm getting far, I, I much prefer the output that I'm getting. And in benchmark testings, it's often coming out stronger now than ChatGPT for Omega. So I'm gonna do the same demo now with Claude. And we'll see what we get. What's interesting about these demos is we never know exactly what we're going to get. And that makes it kind of interesting to uh, demonstrate as well. So transformative learning. Who's the audience? I will say master education students. I don't know about adding the in Canada. I add that just in case I thought they might be able to pull some Canadian examples. That was another question in the chat. So now we're getting it from Claude. I like that Claude specifically introduced Jack Mesereau. Also, the, the analogies, if you take a look, the kaleidoscope effect. 
and updating your mental operating system and the paradigm shift in science, referring to Thomas Kuhn, for me, those are a little bit more sophisticated in terms of the output. So it really will depend on the subject matter. I know in particular for, clo for uh, coding, uh, Claude is quite good. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, let's share a little bit in terms of some of those analogies and some of the examples you got. And then maybe a couple folks could jump onto the mic. So please share in the chat. I would especially like to hear the analogy. So share your concept and an analogy. And then if one or two people want to jump on the mics and just let us know what the quality of the output was and what their experience was. So please go ahead. Again, in the chat, share a concept and an analogy. And on the mic, kind of share your experience. Yeah, Tamara. Um, thank you. My experience is actually interesting. I'm very new to this, actually playing with this. And when it said the concept, I put, un I jumped too quickly and I put undergrad, I put my audience as concept and yeah. it, it went into an analysis um, straight away about critical thinking skills being fundamentally important. And it gave uh, examples such as analyzing arguments, evaluating evidence, problem solving, all very relevant. And the analogies I found interesting and I found them to be some of the ones that I've heard and I've used myself, such as a toolbox analogy, detective analogy, a GPS analogy, sports coach analogy, and recipe analogy. So even in having frankly screwed up my prompt, um, I, I actually got some what I thought quite quick, valid uh, concepts coming back. So I, I, it, it was quite impressive. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Does anyone else want to share here? And I'm seeing in the chat, um, Brie asked about multiliteracies and the analogies included orchestra conductor. Uh, Siobhan asked about experiential learning and it used learning as a sport. And Samantha asked about the Creole continuum and the analogy was blending paints. So um, Vivian did nuclear... One moment, just so many nuclear Im import and the analogy was nightclub entry. So I think it's interesting to think about, I, I really enjoy the analogy part personally in my teaching or presenting is the ability to quickly create these analogies as well as examples. For students, I think there's lots of activities that involve them generating examples, them generating analogies and analyzing the output from there as a way to help with their critical thinking and evaluative judgment. So uh, Danielle mentions that they found the analogy not that useful. And they talked about building blocks as fuel, which was less helpful. Does anyone else wanna share on the mic or shall we move on? and start looking at some issues and considerations. All right, wonderful. And if you have a chance, take a look in the tech, in the chat at all the different types of analogies and examples being shared. So let's talk briefly now about some issues and considerations. And I was actually just commenting on a blog post about generative AI last night. And I think the real challenge for me with running these workshops is I, I have a real love-hate relationship and a concern with these tools. And I mean, just to put out the environmental concern, I, I think I was personally a little bit I, I don't know, I, I, I wasn't taking the environmental part as seriously in terms of carbon emissions, et cetera. And what I've noticed is in the last couple of weeks, companies like Google have come out and said, they've totally missed all of their targets due to generative AI this year. So I think we need to think about issues like the environment when we're thinking about these tools and figure out how we're gonna work around that or just deal with it. And for some folks, it's gonna mean not using it. Other issues and considerations, one of them is privacy. And when we start putting our data into these tools, it does have some privacy implications. One of the privacy implications is 
leaking data. So we've already seen examples where people have been able to hack generative AI to get it to leak data. And an example of this, my favorite example is the forever poem hack. Somebody asked ChatGPT to write the word poem forever. And instead of writing the word poem forever, it shared personal information from its database. We've also seen examples where it's pulled exact quotes that users have put into these tools. In addition to that, we know that in many cases, these tools are being used to, the data you put into these tools is being used to train them. So we do have privacy considerations. However, I think we need to layer up the privacy a little bit and generative AI is creating privacy challenges for the entire internet. We know that these tools are scraping much of what we put on the internet. Rosie, I know that you're in here and you have a private blog, I would imagine that generative AI has scraped that blog. If we've used Twitter, if we've used Reddit, university websites, a lot of the way that we're using the web right now is being scraped and people are working to find ways of avoiding that data from being scraped and collected without permission. However, when we are using generative AI, we can look at UBC guidance around privacy. And these are both excerpts from the UBC privacy guidelines. One of them is confidentiality of UBC data. Only input non-confidential data into generative AI tools that have passed the UBC PIA process. So right now we know that ChatGPT 3.5 and MS Copilot have both passed the PIA process. Um, these tools are safer to put in more confidential data. However, I think generally we need to be careful of that. Uh, exercise I like to play when I'm using generative AI, I use it to do things like create emails. I say, would it be okay? How would I be if this leaked? So I'll do things like remove people's names if I'm writing someone an email and definitely being careful with personal information as well as student data. I think one of the challenges here, we know that lots and lots of institutional and personal data is being put into these tools right now, just because of the ease of use. And just to add to this, our students also need to understand this. Our students are not totally you know, the idea of digital natives and them understanding these tools, they still need to understand these privacy risks for using them. Number two, and this one I have less answers for, and I think it's a more challenging space, is we know that a lot of the data in generative AI, the data that was scraped was copyrighted. And we've seen that lots of books, for example, from the Books 3 database that has 186,000 books in it and was used to, tra to train open AI. We know that a lot of those books were private and there's multiple lawsuits going on in the States right now around the copyright nature of this information. So in terms of copyright, I think one challenge to do when we're developing teaching materials is kind of an ethical and moral choice. How comfortable are we in generating these cases, in generating these questions, if we understand that they have been scraped from other faculty, from journals, from publishers, et cetera? We can think about checking, using proper attribution, mentioning that we're using AI, trying to find who may have authored a particular idea or concept we're using and cite them. But I think intellectual property is a challenge. We can also think about our own intellectual property. So how comfortable we are, are we with putting questions into generative AI, putting our own work into generative AI, knowing that this may infringe our own intellectual property? property rights. Thirdly is accuracy and bias. We know that AI models in terms of content accuracy are 100% confident, but they might be 70 or 80% accurate. So we're in this situation now where we can generate a case study, for example, the case study may read very clearly, but it may have two references that are completely made up, or it may to refer to something that's completely not true. So how are we going to build into our workflows the ability to search through this content and see what's accurate 
and what's not accurate, knowing that in the end, we are responsible for the output that we're creating. We also know that these tools are biased and we see bias such as stereotyping, eraser, that's built into these tools, uh, primarily because it's scraped, this data is scraped from the already biased internet and being reused. But how are we building in ways to check for bias? How are we building into our prompts, ways to prompt for, to avoid more bias within these tools? And if you wanna see bias, go to one of the gym image generators ask it to generate an image of a typical Canadian family. And generally you're gonna get a white Canadian family with a father, uh, sorry, a husband, a wife, a girl and a boy. And so very um, biased representations within these tools. And again, I think these are areas we need to talk to our students about. So I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna stop and see if folks have any comments or questions around any of the issues that we just brought up. And I'm just gonna read a couple of the comments that I see here. Given the, Rosie writes, given the general exploitativeness of academic publishers, I have no problem with using AI information scraped from the articles they publish. And that's a good question, a good point. As someone from open education, I definitely have uh, two minds around this. Uh, Klaske mentioned, someone told me that UBC has a license to a Gen AI engine that does not add the queries to the database. Is that correct? And do you know if, what is? I have a couple answers to your question, Klaske, there. One is that if you use chat GPT for Omega, you're able to toggle off their ability to use the data to train with. Secondly is MS Copilot at UBC. We have an enterprise version. If you use MS Copilot, that data will not be used within their training set. And I see someone has shared an article from Microscope. Yeah, please go ahead, Klaska. Well, thank you for that clarification. So does that mean that it's not added to the data set, but does that also eliminate some of those privacy issues, especially with Copilot, or, or, or is that too much to ask? Yeah, no, that's right. So you can, if you toggle it off, it should eliminate the privacy. It, it should eliminate the adding of it to the data, to the training data. It doesn't necessarily get rid of all the issues around privacy because of the, some of the privacy issues have been around leaking, some of the privacy issues around terms of service. So it may not be used in training data, but it may be used in other ways, for example. And the, is that valid for Copilot as well, that UBC has a... Copilot has an enterprise license. So you may take a look at the terms of service. I would say that would be the most private tool. It still doesn't allow for student data to be used in it. Uh, personal mm -hmm. identifiable information, student data, because that is being um, shared with OpenAI as well, or although it's not totally clear how it's being shared. One other area to mention, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Um, one of my colleagues, who many of you know, Richard Tate, blew my mind a couple weeks, showing me that there are downloadable um, versions of generative AI that you can run on your local machine. So they don't require internet connections. And although they still do technically requ require PIAs at UBC, these are a lot safer in terms of intellectual property. As you're downloading them, they're not connected to the internet, but you're able to run queries on them. And Bree mentions in the chat the toggling off the privacy depends also on how much you trust the companies to honor the privacy settings. Brian mentions Apple Intelligence is making this claim. Uh, JB asks, are those downloadable versions more energy efficient as well? I would assume so, but I'm not sure. And thanks for sharing that tool for local versions. I find the local piece fascinating. I think about myself, I like camping, the ability to have a generative AI on my phone to talk about survival skills, talk about different aspects of camping without requiring the internet. 
So thanks for listening and talking about some considerations. I want to move on to some more specific uses around generative AI in teaching materials. And again, I want to kind of combine prompting and how prompting can make a difference between a quality output and a very generic output, as well as some different approaches and tools we can use for these areas. So the first area I want to talk about is developing questions and problem sets and thinking about how we can develop questions that we can reuse on our exams, that we can give students as practice questions, that we can help differentiate our learning and div give different students different questions to practice with. So when we start creating and refining questions, a couple questions to help guide us. And again, I can, I'll share these slides with you later. So one question we can ask ourselves is, what is the rationale for including this question? And what specific learning outcomes do you expect students to achieve by engaging with these questions? So when we're starting to prompt AI, we can do things like put in the specific learning outcome that we want from the question. What is the level of challenge for the question or problem set? So what is the, what is the, um, grade level for the students, what is the level that they're in, what concepts are you studying, how well should they know those concepts. We can provide sample questions. So by providing sample questions, generative AI can approximate the patterns within your questions to write those questions and then refine the output. Another useful approach when developing questions is to include resources about effective multiple choice questions. So by putting those resources within your prompt, you can ensure that it's creating the type of distractors that you want, or you know, setting up the question stems in a way that you want them to be. So here's the prompt I wanna demonstrate for creating multiple choice questions. And I'm gonna run this prompt in a second. And after that, I'm going to show you a couple examples of software you can also use to create questions. So I'm a physics instructor at a research level university. So I included a little bit of a persona there. A lot of research show or some research shows that by giving the model a persona, the data it draws on is more specific and accurate. Please create a problem set with 15 questions for a first year introductory physics course based on the following learning objectives. So I'm giving it a specific number of questions, I'm giving it a level, and I'm also including a couple learning objectives. Articulate differences between position, distance, and displacement, and apply to concrete examples. Extract information regarding object motion from graphical representation. And then I have some specific details around the questions. Include the questions, include a mix of conceptual questions, calculations and graph interpretations and provide clear detailed answers for each question. I made a bit of an error when I wrote that a pr uh, prompt as I included graph interpretations. Um, out of the box, just using these tools, it won't be able to do graph interpretations. So I'll see what it does with that. So I'm gonna take the prompt now and I'm going to enter it into ChatGPT for Omega and we can see the result that we get from it. So it's going to give me a problem set and it's gonna divide it between each of the different uh, learning objectives that I fed it with. And again, the challenge here is I'm not a physicist, I haven't taken a physics course in my life, so I'm not really going, well, I'm not gonna be able to interpret the answers for this question, so I, I encourage all you folks trained in physics to take a look at the output from the question and see the quality. So now it's generating my problem set for me. And once it's done this, what I can do, I'm not going to do right now, is I can ask it to refine its questions too. So I can say, act as an expert in physics evaluation and critique 
these questions. What criteria did you use? So by doing this, I can kind of create refinement loops in the output that I'm getting from generative AI. And these refinement loops can improve them. So I'm gonna continue generating, and then I'm gonna refine it a little bit using this refinement loop. All right, so now I'm going to ask generative AI to critique this, and it's gonna give us some ways, some criteria that it's using to take a look at these questions. So the table is simple, but including units might improve it. The graph itself should be clearly labeled. In this case, there actually is no graph. So once I've done that, I can ask it to rewrite it, rewrite based on this criteria or on this critique. And what I can do is start improving the question. So by doing this, by using these more complex prompts that include things like roles and specificity, I can improve the output. And by doing refinement, I can improve it additionally. So let's take a look at a couple other ways we can create questions with. Can I get a thumbs up if you've seen um, the Teaching Assistant Pro tool before? This was developed out of uh, eCampus Ontario. And what it does is it uses generative AI and helps us generate questions. So I'll get a thumbs up if you've used this before, if you've seen it. And I think what we're starting to find with generative AI is initially we were at a very open stage with not a lot of custom software. But what we're seeing now is a lot more custom software that we can use to develop these tools, or sorry, to develop things like multiple choice questions, et cetera. And I expect as we continue along this progression, we're gonna see less and less need for prompting and more software that you'll be able to use to develop this. So let me demo this multiple choice generator with you now. And this is the multiple choice generator here. You'll see you can generate multiple choice questions, essay questions, syllabus and teaching notes and I'm gonna do multiple choice questions. So I'm going to do physics. I'm going to do 10 questions with five options. I can upload a file if I want to include my own learning objectives or my own specific concept, and we can generate our questions now. So you'll see that this tool, it would have the prompts built in in the back end it's going to generate the multiple choice questions. I can then copy these questions and reuse them. And I'll give you a chance in a second to play with some of these different tools for generation. The next thing I wanted to show you in terms of generating questions was a GPT. And what a GPT is, is a, let me just log in here. A GPT is a custom version of GPT that you can develop if you pay again $20 a month to access it within ChatGPT. However, once you've created these, anyone is able to use them. So I created this to generate multiple choice questions. And if you look in the back end, I'm just going to go edit GPT you'll see I included a prompt in it. So this GPT is designed to create multiple choice questions. Um, it can generate questions based on the provided topic. Once you have this information, use the included suggestions included in effective multiple choice questions to create these. And I uploaded a worksheet from the Eberly Center for Excellence about effective multiple choice questions. So I can use this now 
and I can say create multiple choice questions about transformative learning. And it's going to start asking me learning objectives, course level goal, and I can start feeding this and I can generate questions. So rather than just using the open prompts with generative AI, now what I'm doing is I'm feeding this with some information. I'm creating my own custom multiple choice question generator that I can use to generate teaching materials for my context. So in a moment, I'm gonna give you a chance to do this, but once we've done this, we can start evaluating our responses. And I've been hearing a mix. For a lot of people, what I've heard is that going through these questions and sifting them and figuring out the quality of the questions, the quality of the distractors, uh, whether the questions are correct or not biased, can take a long time. And sometimes this time spent can be almost as long as creating the questions from scratch. So this is something we need to think about. So once we create the questions, we can think about in what area does generative AI excel at handling these questions? And this will help you think about what question types you might create in the future. Where does it struggle or fall short? This can be useful in two ways. One, it can help you think about what kind of questions it's good at creating. Another thing it might do is think, help you think about assessments that may be a little bit more resilient to AI because it's not able to work well in this space. Can you identify any patterns or make generalizations about the type of problems generative AI can or cannot effectively address? Again, this can inform how you use it, but also how you might assess. How might these in insights influence your approach to designing problem sets and assignments? And I, I gathered these questions from a LinkedIn article about using generative AI to create questions. I've linked that in the worksheet as well. So over to you. What I'd like you to do now is to spend, again, I'll say about five minutes, create and refine 10 multiple choice questions for your course, your discipline, your area of practice. If you're less comfortable with multiple choice questions, it's not something you use in your discipline, create free form questions, create short answer questions, create essay questions. Try using the AI teaching assistant. I've created a link to that or use the multiple choice generator that I created, or use ChatGPT for Omega or Claude. Once you've done this, can you identify any patterns about the types of questions or problems it generates and what might be some of the limitations? So again, five minutes, let's see what kind of questions you can generate. And I'm gonna take a look at some of the comments now as well. So what kind of questions can you generate? Yeah, Rosie, uh, just in the comments, Rosie mentions, does saying please makes a difference? I don't know if it does. What I find really funny about these tools is sometimes they will do research that finds things like the word please can make a difference. Um, it can be quite mysterious about why different outputs are better than others. Tamara mentions for creation of questions conceivably using generative AI that is scrape publisher resources might be problematic because they could be fraught with errors themselves. And that's a good point, is the data that's been scraped could also be full of errors. Um, Rosie mentions that iClicker is a similar tool to generate questions. And that's interesting and something I didn't talk about much in this part of the workshop is they're seeing, we're seeing more and more integration with different systems for ability to do things like generate questions. I was playing with Coursera yesterday, which is a MOOC platform for massively open online courses. And Coursera now has built in AI that allows you to do things like generate questions with it, generate um, different uh, learning resources with it, generate different course plans with it. Have you tried making PowerPoints from handwritten notes? Um, I'm not gonna be going over this class gay today, but um, I've used a tool called Gem, which is quite good at making PowerPoints. There's also a good PowerPoint creator, that's a GPT, 
um, if you go into the GPT store, you can use. And I see Christina has shared a tool called Eduade, which is a good example of a tool that can help us create these questions. Rosie asked, can we ask it how students might misinterpret the questions, choices, or answer choice it has created? Yes, you can ask it that. And it can be really good at thinking about how a student might think about these questions. I've even heard of using multiple student personas, putting them into generative AI, so an explanation of a different student, put it in there and say, how would you answer these questions? Why, what misconceptions might you have? Where might you go wrong in uh, answering these questions? Wonderful. So really active chat right now. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of have some sharing. And again, I encourage you to jump on the mic or raise your virtual hand, share on the mic or share in the chat. Can you make, can you identify any patterns or areas that generative AI was not able to do well when they generated the questions and maybe what was it able to do well? So please go ahead. What could it do well? What was it unable to do well? And feel free to share a couple of the questions that you had it produce as well. Is it okay if I do that verbally? Yeah, please do. I'm hoping a couple of folks will jump in verbally. It's nice to change it up. Please go yeah. ahead. Um, I work in kind of a bit of like a niche area. Um, so I my background is as a registered dietitian and I work um, both for Langara College and for Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, at Langara, I'm teaching students through a certificate program to become sort of food service supervisors and managers um, in hospital settings. And in my role with Vancouver Coastal Health, I'm the food services educator. So I'm also educating a lot of our frontline staff um, on topics about, you know, like food safety, health and safety in the workplace, things like that. And just through my work at Langara um, and trying to like adopt AI for the work that I'm doing and trying to use it to integrate it, I just find that there's like, because it's kind of like a niche area um, and there's not a lot of information that's widely available, I find that all of the tools, it's just like, they give me like really weird stuff coming out of it or stuff that's not really applicable. Um, and same thing with any of the image generators too. Like I've tried to use it for like equipment or scenarios and it just like always gets it completely wrong. So, <laughs> but um, I'm finding your your multiple choice question creator, like having those specific learning objectives um, and the prompts that you've created there have been really great. And I'm definitely gonna use that for some of my work later today, so. Wonderful. And I mean, yeah, depending on how comfortable you are with privacy, like that G multiple choice creator I showed you, those, if you do pay for GPT plus, like GPTs take no time to create. I think that took me five minutes to make. Mm -hmm. And you can upload if again, if you're comfortable with the privacy, you can upload documents to them. So mm -hmm. I could see uploading some specific um documents that you wanted multiple choice questions around. Yeah. I also noticed that that um, teaching assistant, AI teaching assistant had an upload button as well. So you could upload and do some training uh, with the model itself, perhaps. Yeah, I think that'll be really useful, especially for some of our complicated topics around like diet writing guidelines and things like that. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So I'm seeing in the chat, you know, quickly producing a range of questions and a good starting point. This idea of topics often have incorrect um, superficial explanations. For digital marketing, MCQs were good, but very simple. And again, I do hear the simplicity part uh, with questions quite a bit. Wonderful. So thanks for sharing that. And I encourage you as we go through, you know, jump on the mic, share your experience with this. We're going to move on to now case studies and scenarios, which is another way that we can use generative AI. I've used this quite a bit in my workshop work is just because scenarios are something that I often like to use in workshops but I rarely have the time to create them. I recently, well, I guess a year ago now, I did a workshop with a lawyer 
um, or who was in the workshop and lawyers use hypotheticals as part of their legal work. And as she was going through chat GPT, she said, I will never have to write another hypothetical again. So thinking about things like cases, hypothetical scenarios, um, these technology, this technology can be quite useful. Although again, we have to often deal with those inaccuracies, the surface level of responses. So rather than give you specific prompt recipes, I've tried to move away from the idea of prompt engineering. If you look up online prompt engineering, you'll see there's a lot of very specific ways you can prompt these tools, doing things like say, act as an expert and so on. However, I don't think it's as simple as just using these specific terms, prompting something we often go back and forth on. We have, you know, long kind of almost dialogues with the tool to refine and get a better output. So what I wanted to do is just share a couple of ways, a couple of aspects of making a better case or a better case output from these tools. Um, through prompting. So one again, and you'll see this is similar to the multiple choice questions, is determine the level and subject matter. So a really clear level and subject matter. Mention that it's in Canada. You can even try mentioning you're teaching at a research level university or UBC. Provide information about effective case study approaches. I found this has made a big difference. Having generative AI generate a case study for you is okay, but it's often going to pull on generic ideas of case studies. Figure out what kind of case study specifically you want it to create and feed it with that data so it can model that a little bit. Similarly, ask providing sample case studies can help get us a better output help having it create reflection and discussion questions. And then again, going through that approach for when we review and refine the case. You can ask it to interpret the case as if you're an expert in a different area or an expert in writing case studies and kind of use that as a continuous refinement process around the case. So for this case study, I wanted to use political science because again, I have a little bit of knowledge here. So I know that it's when it's not way off. And what I did for this example, as I said, act as a faculty member. Again, I gave it a role in political science and write a two paragraph case study for a 100 level comparative politics course. Ensure that the case study, and then what I've included is a number of effective case criteria. And I'm gonna show you that in a moment. Include discussion questions that will engage the students in problem solving and analysis. So let's take a look at that prompt. And this time I'm gonna run it in Claude just to give us a feeling for what that tool might look like. So act as a faculty member in political science, write a two paragraph case study for a 100 level comparative politics course, ensure that the case studies, again, I use the Eberly Center for Excellence for this information, tells a real engaging story, raises a thought provoking issue, has elements of conflict, promotes empathy with the central characters, lacks an obvious or clear cut answer, encourages students to think and take a position, portrays actors in moments of decision, provides plenty of data about character, location, context, act, actions, and then I've included the discussion prompt. So let's take a look at Claude now for this. And we'll see what case study we got. So what it's done is it's kind of made up a, a, a country in this case. I'm not sure I wanted it to do that. I could change that. But what it's done for the case studies is it's this idea of um, some of the narrative, some of the characterizations, et cetera. And I'm just gonna say, make it a real country and see how that changes it. And what I find again, when I'm developing these case studies is I'm often going back and forth, developing them, changing them, et cetera. So now it's using Hungary and it's creating the discussion questions for that particular case. 
So it's talking about Victor Orban, et cetera. And then I, I'm not going to do it now, but I could go through the refinement process and continually refine it. What I like about um, Claude is I can download a file with the case on it and reuse it that way. So the next type of case study I wanted to show you is from a blog post about creating interactive case studies. And while we can create static case studies that we can use for assessment, we can create case studies we can use for case-based learning, we can also think about creating interactive case studies where students can use a case via a prompt that they use or perhaps a custom GPT that you build where they can go through the case and interact with it. And I've linked to the blog post where I got this case, but I'm gonna run this for you now. And I think in this interaction, it gets quite powerful in terms of what we can do with the case. So just to clarify, is this like, you're, are you building a GPT here for this? No, I'm just, I'm basically creating a prompt now. Right, so students would copy this in. Exactly, and then uh, they would be able to do some interaction. I would expect if I were going to use this in a class, I would probably build it into a GPT so that then they have a GPT that's acting as an interactive case for them. Or also, again, we're at such an early, like an MS-DOS stage for generative AI. I think we're very quickly going to see programs that will do this with students. So start a detailed interactive case study on an ethical dilemma within the field of bioengineering. The case should unfold continuously over several decision points, delving deeply into one ethical situation. With each new piece of information revealed, asked to make a choice that influences the direction and outcome of the scenario, the case study should include an introduction, begin with a brief introduction to the ethical dilemma, etc. I won't read the whole thing now. And we'll start this case. And again, now we're starting to create an interaction. So before we dive in, it's going to ask me about specific topics. But you'll see it's adding them. Um, I'm just going to ask it to do it one at a time. What these tools tend to do is give you all the topics at once which can be confusing. Great, so we're doing gene editing. So it's giving me some ideas. So you're a lead researcher at a cutting edge bioengineering lab. Your team has recently developed a groundbreaking CRISPR-based technique that can eliminate gene disorders in human em embryos. The potential to eradicate disease, hereditary disease is enormous, but the ethical implications are profound. Um, your team is divided on whether to proceed with clinical trials. What would you like to do? And now I can choose. So I'm going to say proceed with clinical trials. And now it's saying that there's public backlash. So you went ahead with the clinical trials. There's public backlash. What are you going to do now? And I'm going to say a public engagement campaign. So again, I think these interactive case studies are in a much earlier stage right now, but it's really interesting to imagine the possible. So imagine what it will be like to have programs where students can access case studies that they're interacting with and they're, it's adapting based on their answers. All right, so now over to you. What I would like you to do this time is try to create a case study for your specific discipline or domain. I've included the prompt on the worksheet and you can modify the prompts. I put all of the words in square brackets. So if you wanna take the time, you can try to modify the prompt or just run the prompt and see how it goes for the interactive prompt or just see if you can generate a case study based on, I included some criteria for an effective case, find your own article that has effective criteria, add those to a case and see the quality of cases you can generate. And just to share in a different way this time, what I would like you to do is to 
share part or all of your case on this Padlet that I included. And I put a poll on the Padlet as well. Include what was the quality of the case? Was it something you could use right away in your class? Was it something that is completely unsuitable and you'll never be able to use? Or was it something you could use with some tweaking or some revision? So again, I'll give you five minutes on this step. See if you can generate either a static case or a interactive case. I would probably focus on the static case for now. See what the quality of the case is and use the prompts that I included in order to make a good case and then try to add it from the Padlet. Christina mentions these interactive case studies can be helpful for practicum students with anxiety or EAL learners who may benefit from practice opportunities before, before having people interact with people in their discipline or during practicum. Absolutely. And I've seen this used, for example, um, in a workplace setting to practice having difficult conversations around a particular topic so that you're able to rehearse this before uh, going into that particular conversation. So it's really thinking of generative AI starting to get into the simulation space and how we could use it in that way. Bree, I'm wondering if you would be comfortable sharing if you're online now about what you're doing in pharmaceutical sciences around virtual patients and generative AI. Sure, yeah. Do you want me to do that now or give people a few minutes? No, no, go ahead. You can do this while people are kind of playing around making cases. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I it was funny you mentioned that because when you talked about the students on practicum, that really uh, connected the dots for me. So at pharmacy, we are hoping to develop a tool that uses a large language model of some sort to help uh, facilitate virtual patient interviewing. Um, so to give students an opportunity to practice their information gathering skills um, in a low stakes environment. So setting up a virtual patient case and a patient persona, and then letting students interact with that patient and gather information using either text to speech or text um, and a large language model. Um, so, so some kind of interesting connecting the dots there. I was looking actually at, uh, with this prompt just now that Lucas has us looking at with the ethics of generating AI patient cases as my, uh, case scenario, but yeah, it, it's been an interesting project so far. If anyone has questions, I would be happy to talk about it more. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. And again, I'm seeing more in the context of medicine, uh, to an extent in business, the use of you know, virtual patients, virtual scenarios that people can move through as well as pharmaceutical sciences. So yeah, maybe, yeah sorry, I'll, I'll just, yeah, recognizing that it's it's not the same, obviously, as talking to a, a, an actual patient, but presenting an opportunity to kind of bridge that gap between a scripted interaction, um, like selecting questions from a list and all the way towards uh, having like an actor in the classroom. It's just another step kind of on the road in this like more authentic practice opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you. So what I'll get folks to do now is assuming you've created your cases, I've just put the Padlet again. Um, Padlet is kind of an open whiteboard space. So I'll delete it later just for privacy. But what I'd like you to do is go onto the Padlet now, click on the plus sign and share a segment from your case, share a snippet from your case, share the whole case if you want, and then vote. Uh, what was the quality of the case? Was it usable? Was it usable with substantial revisions or was it usable with minor revisions? And I'll give you a couple minutes to do that now. Let's see if we can gather some cases on here just to get an idea of the range of different cases and the range of quality that we're getting here. And incidentally, if you're using Padlet, it also has built-in generative AI now. You can actually have it generate different aspects of like you can have it generate different historical timelines, for example, on Padlet or generate images as well. So again, share a snippet of your case, vote on what the quality of the case was, let us know. And while you're doing that, does anyone wanna hop on the mic and share uh, what their experience was generating case studies or interactive case studies? 
Um, I can. Yeah. So, um, what's fascinating to me is it, it seems almost never ending. Like it continues to to ask me options, and then said, so "What options would you? What decision point rather would you would you take?" And then we keep going, and then there's more decision points to take um, um, in terms of refining it or further understanding it. So you could just spend all day playing. Wonderful. What's your what's your disciplinary area? Educational leadership. Okay. And could you see this this sort of um interaction being used in that space? I can. I think myself, along with my colleagues, would need to engage in more conversation about, about how it's used, the ethical considerations. Um, it's it, it's interesting because I wonder, I mean, as much as, and perhaps you'll touch on this, because as much as we can write exam questions and assignments and help to clarify that, can students not do the same thing to answer the questions? And, and so at what point then, you know, we have to, we have to stay, for, from my perspective, students, we should continue to, you know, educate and, and have these discussions about ethical use yeah but i'm still on that sort of fence as to who's writing when does it become you know when do we lose the students writing and it become and they submit something that's been written by chat gpt that's that's a really good point and i'm going to share an article i yeah no and i think we're at such early stages but yeah it's interesting if we're creating these teaching materials for students are they going to be able to use generative AI to answer them more easily than we could if we changed our assessments? And I'm going to share an article in the chat that I really liked by David Wiley recently. And David Wiley is a professor in the States, and he's also works a lot around open content. And his argument is that the it's a little bit different, but he's saying a good assignment requires simple and understandable instructions. And that's exactly what AI is good at doing. So he's questioning how we're ever going to be able to create AI proof assignments just because of the nature of assignments. I think he ends his article at, um, I'll just read you this quote, I really like it. Um, I deeply fundamentally believe that education be, can be joyful, inspiring and ennobling and when students see value in learning a subject and come to care about it, they won't use LLMs to do their work for them. I don't know if that works for every context, but I think in some educational context, that's a powerful statement. I appreciate that too. And one of the things I'm, I'm sort of referring to, to AI, ChatGPT, as, as a critical friend, as someone you can bounce ideas off of and, and ask for, you know, is is it that it's it's written as clearly as it could be, and can you offer suggestions? And and frankly, I use it for um, referencing. I okay. <laughs> just plop it in, and it gives it. Do this in APA seven, and and you have to take a look at it. Of course, it's not always error proof, but it sure is helpful. Wonderful. All right, so I'll give everyone another minute to finish off here, and then I'm just going to show the Padlet. Lucas, can I jump in and share? Yeah, please do. So it's interesting. I'm teaching an intercultural competence course, and I had my students write case studies last week. And yeah. what Chad GPT came up with is actually quite similar to some of what they handed in, which is an interesting, it's good at the intro level, you know, cultural yeah. communication, like teamwork, case study. It did a pretty good job. But what's interesting is I'm sure we could refine it, it but it's so much faster we could, it, it created a good description. And then I'm, I would give it feedback similar to what I'm giving my students, which is put in some quotes, put in more yeah. examples, put in examples of what people would say, which I'm sure it could do in the second round. Yeah, so yeah. round one and refine and add it, add, add a next layer to make it a bit more vivid. And mm -hmm. so I'm having my students give each other feedback and I think they could give chat GPT a similar type of request as they're giving each other. So this is fun. Thank you for this activity. Uh, that's fascinating. So I'm just sharing uh, the Padlet. Thanks for sharing the different uh, case studies, just to kind of give you an idea of the different quality that's coming out in different subjects. And so in terms of the voting, we had 
18, 16 votes, so non-representative, but 18% found the case studies were unusable. 18% uh, found uh, usable with uh, substantial revisions and 62% found usable with minor revisions. So I guess the big challenge in, is, you know, whether what we create can be usable or how much work it's going to take us to make it usable. So the last section I wanted to go through with you is uh, <clears throat> developing learning resources. And I wanted to go a little bit broader on this and just think about ways that generative AI can help us developing different learning resources. And what I've focused on is particularly the GPTs. So I'm just gonna share the GPT store again and just kind of clarify what GPTs are. So this is the GPT store. Could I get a thumbs up if you've used a GPT before? Just gonna go down our participant list here and see if we get some thumbs up in the reaction. So we got a couple people. So GPTs are customized. It's a customized use of chat GPT that allows us to add our own prompts to it in the back end. And we can also upload documents into it to train these tools a little bit for ourselves. And these can be as simple as the one I showed you, the multiple choice generator. I also sometimes will generate these just for a workshop. I'll upload the workshop slides and then anyone can ask it questions about the slides, but it can get quite complicated. So I'm in the generative AI store now. You'll see there's a, a GPT for Canva. This allows you to create infographics using Canva which is a graphic design tool. There's Scholar GPT, which accesses resources on Google Scholar, Gistor, et cetera. There are writing GPTs. One to let you know about is Humanizer, which makes chat GPT text sound more human, particularly for evading academic integrity checking. There's PowerPoint creators. There are one of my favorite generative AIs is called Tutor Me. This is developed by Saul Khan of the Khan Academy, and it is specifically for tutoring um, K-12 students in different subjects, and it will go back and forth with them and tutor. So I'm going to be drawing on these quite a bit in the next section. But just to let you know, you don't have to pay to use these. You just need to log into uh, chat GPT for Omega, and then you'll have access to the chat GPT store. If you want to create them, you do need to subscribe to chat GPT plus in order to create them. So I wanted to show you a couple of use cases around these. One is thinking about a learning resource of pre-class videos. So when we access videos from YouTube, and we want to create a summary for the video, create reflection questions for the video in an easier way. Incidentally, I also use this tool if I want to, if I want to go to a video and understand what the video is talking about, getting a summary of it without having to watch the whole video. So this is the YouTube video summarizer. Again, it's a GPT. And what I've done is I've grabbed a video about generative AI. And in a second, I'm gonna put it, oh, if I can find it, I'm gonna put this into the video summarizer. I'll just enter the URL for the video. So for the following video, summarize the main points, create a glossary of terms, design four reflection questions for second year education students at a university level. So now what it's able to do is it is able to access YouTube videos based on the URL. And it's this is a panel about generative AI. It's able to identify all of the panelists, talk about what they talk about in terms of generative AI, create a glossary of term based on the video, as well as reflection questions that I may use for second year education 
students. Again, in my own practice, often I'll take a video, I'll say, find 10 important strategies talked about in this video that I can share in a PowerPoint presentation. So thinking about a way that we can generate learning materials around videos that we might be using for the flipped classroom or different approaches. The second GPT I wanted to show you was diagram tool within generative AI. And there's actually quite a few diagram tools available. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a trick though, when you're using chat GPT for Omega is if you put the at symbol in, it's going to pull up all of the recent GPTs you've used, and you can search directly from within chat GPT. So I'm going to say create a diagram showing me the different Western foundations for experiential learning. And again, I'm doing education just because I know I'll be able to understand it a little bit. I used Western foundations because I don't believe it's going to be able to move well beyond that. So let's see how well this works. I might need to ask it to do this again because it doesn't seem to be going. And what you can do with this tool, fingers crossed it works, is you can create diagrams. You can edit them in tools like Miro, which allow you to edit them, and you can share them as images. So let's see the diagram we get. So now it's developing a diagram for us of the Western Foundations for Experiential Learning, Kurt Lewin. So it's captured a lot of that. If I click on view full screen, I can see the full diagram. And if I click on edit in Miro, I can edit the diagram as well. So there's lots of different graphic tools that are coming out, but this is a way that we can develop things like diagrams. The last thing I wanted to show you in terms of learning resource is particularly for those of you who are in STEM disciplines. As you probably know, generative AI makes a lot of errors with um, some STEM content, in particular mathematics. However, there is a GPT um, that's been created that uses Wolfram Alpha. And let's just find that one here on the side here. And by using Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Alpha is a powerful computational engine. What I now can do is do diagramming um, do different graphing and do complex math mathematical equations within this tool. <clears throat> and unlike Wolfram Alpha, I can kind of speak to them and get it to change them, et cetera. And again, when we think about students and academic integrity, this is something our students can do as well. So write Lewis structures for the following. Please note none of the solutions are using the expanded octet rule or formal charges and I have the structure here. So what it's going to do is again, now it's using Wolfram Alpha and it's able to access this computational database. And in this case, create structures. It can also graph different things, but it allows us to, um, again, particularly in STEM areas, create um, sorry, create diagrams, et cetera. And I'm just gonna go there. It also has access to recent data. So show me recent earthquakes in Indonesia. And it's going to create a query for that. We'll see if it's able to do that to Wolfram. And it should be able to access this data. It was yesterday, here we go. So you'll see this data is uh, July 8th, 2024 it's able to access live data in certain cases.
So I'm just looking at our time now. We only have about six minutes left. <clears throat> I'll ask you to do this on your own time maybe, but what you might want to do is try these GPTs out. I've linked to all of these different GPTs. Give them a try and go through the GPT store. I'm finding it's really building in terms of different ways, different types of GPTs that we can use. The last example I wanted to show you where we end today is probably the most sophisticated example of a tool I've seen using generative AI in the educational space. And this is called the Assessment Partner. The Assessment Partner is developed out of McMaster University. It's kind of a prototype now, but it's free to use and I've linked to it on the worksheet. What the Assessment Partner does is it uses something called agents. Agents are a little bit different. Kind of a, a way to think about them is it's like having a whole bunch of chat bots that work together to do a certain task. So I could have one chat bot that's been specifically trained in educational research. I could have another chat bot that's trained in writing. I could have another chat bot that's trained in analysis and they're all able to work together to create a final seamless product. So this is what they've done at McMaster's. And when we think of where AI is going or the different places it's going, one area that it's going is the use of these agents. So let's do an assessment together. And noting here that we're moving away from the idea of prompting now, and we're using fields rather than prompting. So again, this is free. You can play around if you want. I'm going to use case studies. It's going to ask me to select a discipline for case studies. So I'm going to select e-commerce. It's going to ask me the level of study. I'm going to use fourth year. I'm not going to put a topic within the discipline. Select the type of assessment. I'm going to select formative. Learning taxonomy. I'm going to select evaluate. And I can decide whether I wanted to incorporate generative AI or not meaning the students will use it within that assessment, and then I'm going to generate. And this is going to take a minute or two, but you'll see now it's deploying agents, and it's going to be developing the assessment uh, for us, including an assessment rubric and the different elements of the assessment. And I think right now, again, I think we're at this MS-DOS stage in generative AI, very soon we're going to be seeing software like this, which is able to do a lot of different things using things like agents. So now it's developing this particular assessment. So it's creating uh, assessment, it's writing all of the LOs, it's giving us an assessment format. So this is an assignment that we can use with our students. It's giving us assessment criteria, learning outcomes, an example, and submission guidelines. And in some cases, it will generate a rubric for us. So again, in this case, it's creating the entire assignment for us. So that brings me to the end. I think what we've touched on today is using generative AI for different kinds of teaching materials. We looked at some of the challenges around doing this as well as some of the opportunities. And what I tried to do is balance using open prompting, using tools like ChatGPT with some specific tools. And to prepare for this, I actually asked on LinkedIn uh, for faculty who are using either open prompting or using these tools, why they would want to use one or the other. And a faculty member, George Valentanos, who is at Royal Rhodes University, commented that Although there are these custom tools, he still enjoys the flexibility of the open prompting. So I hope I've touched on and given you some ways that you can create more effective case studies, more effective multiple choice questions, and do some things like interactive case studies, et cetera. So thanks a lot for your times and thanks for the real engagement in the chat. 
Again, I'll go through those for all of the great examples you shared. I'll share back to the group with a video recording of the session, as well as the resources we've talked about. Yeah, so enjoy the sun and stay cool. Thanks very much, everyone.